Good Sunday morning, Community Baptist Church. Welcome. We're glad you're here. We're going to start off a little bit differently this morning. I want you to stand up with us, and as you stand up, I want you to turn to somebody, wish them an early Merry Christmas, and to say hi to them this morning. Thank you. 
You guys may be seated. So every year about this time, we enter into a season known as Advent. And the word Advent literally means coming. And so just as God's people had to uh, anticipate and wait for the coming of God's promised king, we join in with them as we look forward to the pinnacle of this season, as we get to celebrate the birth of our Savior, Jesus. And, and it's at this moment where we get to uh, remember that it is Jesus who has restored our relationship with God. And so each week during Advent, we light a candle, an Advent candle. And each candle that's lit, it represents a gift that Jesus has given to us. And then this week, we light the candle of hope. Because there was a time when there was very little hope in the world. And it was because of God's faithfulness, His relentlessness, and His desire to be in a community, be in community with us. And He spoke through some amazing people, He spoke through prophets, and His message was very simple. He's saying, hope is coming. Hope is coming. And this hope actually has a name. It's Emmanuel, God with us. So this hope is literally the presence of God with us to lead us, to guide us, to strengthen us. And I don't know about you guys, but I need to know that. I need to know that. We need to know that. And the beautiful thing about this moment is maybe that's you walking in today. Maybe you're walking in with less hope than you had yesterday. Maybe you're in complete despair. And so you need to know. You have to know. I want you to know that just as Jesus came 2,000 years ago with a mission of hope, that mission has not left the earth. That that hope is still here. And that hope is something that you can latch on to. That hope is something that you can grab onto. And so I don't know what f- traps you're facing in your life. It might be health. It might be that you're totally sane, but the rest of your family is insane. It might be just the busyness of the season that's just wearing you down. It might be relationships that are just hard to deal with at this moment. But Jesus is offering you hope. Jesus is offering you hope right now. At this moment, it can be yours. You can have hope. So I want to invite you that maybe this is the moment where you surrender all those life traps, all the, whatever it is you're facing. This is a moment where you surrender just yourself and invite Jesus to bring hope into your life, for that to well up inside of you. And so I want to encourage you today during the service that anytime you happen to glance at this lit candle, anytime you steal a look at this flame, that you remember that it signifies the hope that Jesus brings to our world, the hope that Jesus brings to your life. And may his hope light up your heart today. Join me in a word of prayer. Father, thank you for bringing hope. May that hope be something tangible as we just face life. Lord, I pray that the hope you've given us isn't something that we hoard, something that we selfishly hold on to, something that we hide, but that we actively seek to give that hope to others. Thank you for the gift that is your son, Jesus Christ who makes all things new, who makes us new. It's in Christ's name. Amen. I want to invite you to take a look at any of the screens that we have. We have a video for you guys. much needed gathering place for services, offices for the staff, and classrooms for the children. It was a huge step forward in helping families be transformed for generations. 
A decade later, we took another large step for families when construction was completed on the Family Life Center. This building provided an upgrade for ministry to kids and teenagers. They were given their very own space to gather, have fun, and encounter Jesus. Thinking about all the children whose lives have been impacted in the 25 years of the Family Life Center shows how deeply families can be transformed. And now, in 2018, we want to take another step in helping to see families transform for generations. The North Lawn has been home to some great ministry over the years. It has hosted Easter services, baptisms, VBS games, giant slip and slides, and so much more. The North Lawn has been such a great space for so many years, and with some changes, we think that it can be even better for many more years to come. Our year-end drive this year is called Made in the Shade, the idea for which comes from Psalm 36, 7, which says, How priceless is your unfailing love, O God. People take refuge in the shadow of your wings. We want to create a space on the North Lawn where children, teens, adults, and families can find refuge in God's love as they connect with each other and encounter Jesus. We want to add some canopies to provide shade on warm summer days, as well as seating that families can enjoy during special events or after services on the weekends. We want to extend the sidewalk and add a small stage area for baptisms and other outdoor events throughout the year. We want to enhance the lighting on the northernmost end of the lawn, as well as make improvements to the sidewalk, drainage, and the lawn itself. These changes will be the next step in CBC's 40-year history of reaching out to our community to see family transform for generations. Along with being made in the shade and experiencing the refuge of God's love, we also want to extend that love to the world around us. So we're going to go beyond our regular 10% and give 15% of whatever we raise during our year-end drive to an orphanage in Kenya that doesn't have a roof. There's a building for these children in need, but they don't have a roof. So while we aim to raise canopies to provide shade for ourselves, we'll also be working to literally put a roof over the heads of children who desperately need one. So would you please consider how you might go over and above your regular giving to see CBC and an orphanage made in the shade? God loves us, and his church should be a place of refuge and love for all people, whether that refuge is found on a lawn in Rancho Cucamonga or an orphanage in Kenya. Please visit findcommunity.com slash made in the shade for more information or to give. Well, if that's the first time you've seen the video, if, if uh, you want to go online, the full video is on there, and then you can catch the first couple of seconds of, of audio. But I'm so excited for the tagline, Made in the Shade. I think it's so catchy. It's so cool. I'm looking forward to the improvements that we're going to make on the North Lawn. It's going to be great. But what I'm most excited about is that CBC continually tries to look beyond just what we need, what we should go after, and help other people. I'm excited that we're going to be part of putting a roof on an orphanage in Kenya. And we hope that you guys would want to be a part of that as well. So if you'd like more information or you want to give online on our website, findcommunity.com slash made in the shade. Or if you're going to go ahead and just put it like in an envelope and like today and later on in the, in the offering, just make sure that you mark YED somewhere on the envelope so that we know that's what it's specifically going towards. Now, if we have not met yet, my name is Brad Twitty, and I get to be the pastor of students here. And uh, if someone hasn't done this yet, we just want to welcome you to CBC. We're glad that you guys decided to spend your Sunday morning with us, worship with us, and we hope it's a, just a, a really relaxing time, a time where you can engage Christ and uh and hopefully it'll be a little fun too. So we want to welcome you here. I just have a few things to share with you uh, as we continue on. The first one is if you've got an I'm here card, if you wouldn't mind filling that out, letting us know who you are. Maybe you've changed your address and you just need to update. Maybe you've got a prayer request or there's something going on in your life that you want to share, like a victory or, a, or just a struggle and, and, and you need some prayer. We'd love for you guys to use that. And if you didn't grab a bulletin on your way in, I think there's uh, I'm here cards in the seat pockets in front of you. As well, So take a uh, moment, fill that out, and there will be a time later on in the service where you can drop that off and a basket will collect that. Now, also one other thing that we have to share with you is Kids Space Winter Camp. It's coming. I know, I know it seems like really early that we're talking about this, but it's here. And it's going to be so awesome for 4th, 5th, and 6th graders. They're going to go January 26th through the 28th, and it's at Thousand Pines, uh, and it's $200 per, per student. Now, I know that might seem like a lot of money. But I'm going to tell you as, as uh, an advocate for camp, like this could be a pivotal weekend in the life of your student. 
This could be a weekend where all of a sudden their hearts ignited, their faith is on fire, and they come home a totally different person, ready to serve Jesus, ready to serve the community. And so I would just suggest that if you've got a fourth, fifth, or sixth grader, don't miss this opportunity to have a free weekend for yourself, right? Because that's important too. Now, here's the other thing. I would encourage you that if you don't have a fourth, fifth, or sixth grader, or you don't have a student that's in high school or junior high or an elementary student or anything like that, that you can still get involved that you can actually give just a little bit for a family that might need a little bit of help. Maybe it's 20 bucks. Maybe you can totally do the whole 200 and just scholarship somebody to camp, give them a chance to, to work on their relationship with Christ. So there's lots of ways you can get involved. You can go online at findcommunity.com slash kidscamp. We have a table out in the courtyard or children's and youth table. You can get more information. You can sign up there as well. And so don't miss this opportunity for your student. And the last thing I want to share with you is something called a congregational interaction meeting. Sounds horribly formal and very serious, but it's actually not that. Uh, every year, the church has to, um, ha- has to put together a budget, and the board has to approve that budget. So just like you guys as a family are setting up budgets and, and working through finance stuff, we have to do the same thing uh, as a church. And so CBC partners uh, will have a chance to vote for this budget, affirm new board members that are coming on, and I believe also vote for new partners that are coming this year. And so that's going to actually happen December 15th and 17th, so you don't want to miss it. Um, But if you'd like information about what the budget looks like, maybe you didn't even know we had a budget, and you just are like, well, how does this even work with something like this? And you just want information next weekend after the services, I believe in Pastor Rob's office, there's going to be Kent Pomeroy, our amazing director of administration. He's like a wizard when it comes to numbers and stuff like that. He's really awesome. Some board members, and you can have a chance to just talk to them, get to know them, find out that we actually do have a board and, and meet them, or, or just get information about how this all works. And so um, really one of the things that is important is if you call CBC home, we want you to be in the know. We are transparent with what we're doing, with what you give, we don't have, we're not hiding any secrets or anything like that. And not only do we want you just to be in the know, we want to share that information with you guys so you guys jump in and join us with where we're going, where we feel like God's calling us to go. So it's a really important thing, and we'd invite you guys to be a part of that. And, of course, you know, all this stuff you can find on findcommunity.com, or findcommunity.com slash this week. All right. At this time, I'd like you to take a breath, breathe for just a moment, and I'd like to invite you to posture your heart to hear Lord's message. Good morning. Nice to see all of you. I love Christmas. Good. I'm glad you're not Scroogey or Grinchy. Yeah, those guys are weird. Uh, I love Christmas. It kind of really is my favorite time of year. It's pretty basic, I know. But I love it. I loved it as a kid. I loved it as an adult. I loved sitting in our living room kind of like this when I was younger, and I would just stare at all the presents underneath the tree. I would count them to make sure there were more for me than were there for my sister. If nobody was home, I would shake them to try to figure out what they were. It got to the point where my sister knew that I would like to shake my presents, so she would get like a very small present and wrap it in all sorts of tissue paper and put it in a box, then wrap that in a tissue paper and put that in a bigger box. And then I had this giant present. I'm like, oh, that's the biggest present I've ever seen. And then it would take me five minutes to unwrap it, and it would be socks. Uh, so my sister knew what was going on. And I still like getting presents, and I have a picture. Last year, my wife, Alicia, got me this, and it is the Lego Millennium Falcon. (laughs) And when I opened it, I could not believe that my wife had actually purchased me a giant Lego set for Christmas, because that is impractical. It does not do anything. If anything, it's a danger to our small daughter who would pick up the pieces and choke on them. 
But I loved it. I love getting presents. Now, I really liked when I was younger receiving gifts. And when I was younger, I would spend hours upon hours on my Christmas list. I think I've shared with you before that I would just sit there with the J.C. Penny catalog, which for those of you who are young, was like Amazon in a book form. And I would sit there, and that joke worked last year too. Nailed it. And so I would go through that catalog, and I would write down all the things that I want, and then I would give my lip, my, this you know, three-page list to my mom, like, Mom, I want everything on here. And she's right there. She knows this is true. And so now, though, as I've gotten older, I, I don't care as much about what I want. In fact, my mom was texting me last night. I was like, hey, I need a list. I'm like, fine, I'll put something together for you. Because I, I, I'm more concerned, like I'm more excited to buy presents for other people and give, it, give them to them. I spend more time thinking about gifts for others than I do thinking about gifts for myself. And unfortunately, that attitude of giving to others instead of giving to myself doesn't really pervade my entire life. I really only think about it at Christmas. Because perhaps you're like me, and it's all too easy to think about what you want or what you need or what you want people to give to you instead of thinking about others. Think about what you could give to them, what you could offer to them, how you could make a positive impact in their lives. And at Christmas, we really have a great metaphor for that attitude, the attitude that we should have of giving to others instead of being so focused on giving to ourselves. Are we going to be people who focus solely on what we want and the gifts that we're given, or are we also going to think about others and what we could potentially give to them? And that's what our series during Advent is all about this year. It's called Given to Give. It's about the things that Jesus gave to us and, where, and how we're called to give them to others. So we have giant presents over here. There's the to us present, and then also the two others present. And so this morning, we'll be in the book of Micah, chapter 5. If you need a Bible, our ushers will be more than happy to bring you one. Or you can just go to the Bible app and pull it up in there. Got all the notes. And so at Christmas, we celebrate the reality that God loved us enough to send his son to be with us. Jesus was born in a stable in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago, and he forever altered history. That birth marked heaven breaking through to earth, the kingdom of God being revealed in that manger. And through the millennia since, that kingdom has continued to spread and grow and change the world around us because Jesus wasn't just a baby boy born in a feeding trough, but he came a teacher. He eventually went to the cross and died, and he rose again, defeating death and sin, giving us the opportunity to enter back into a right relationship with God. And so as we look back on that first Christmas throughout the month of December, we'll be looking at some of the gifts that were given to you and me through Jesus and how we can give those gifts to others in return. And those gifts are hope, love, joy, peace, and faith. We have been given those things through Jesus. Jesus gave us those gifts through his birth. And now we're called to give those to others as well. And this morning, as Brad shared with the Advent candle, we will be talking about hope, how Jesus' birth gave us hope and what it might look like for us to give hope to others in return. And so think about the first Christmas. The nation of Israel had probably lost most of their hope waiting for Jesus to be born. The nation of Israel, they had sprung from their forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If you want to know more about that, read the book of Genesis They'd been enslaved in Egypt for hundreds of years. If you want to know that? Read the book of Exodus. They experienced their height as a nation under the rule of King David. If you want to know more about that, read First and Second Samuel. After that, they experienced hundreds of years of war and civil war and exile. And eventually they were brought back to their home, but they were subjected to the Roman Empire. So they had hopes. In spite of everything they experienced, though, they, they still had hope. They clung to a sliver of hope, and they had hope. Because God had promised hundreds of years before through his prophets that eventually he would send somebody, he would send his chosen one, and that chosen one would make everything right. So that's the hope that they cling to. And one such prophecy comes from the book of Micah. And Micah lived about 700 years before Jesus and made lots of prophecies to Israel, the northern kingdom, and Judah, the southern kingdom, some of them about judgment but a lot of them also about hope. And so if you want to look at Micah chapter 5, 
beginning in verse 2, we'll see one of these hopeful prophecies that Micah had. So he, he wrote, But you, Bethlehem Arapha, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, or, or from old, from ancient times. And therefore Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor bears a son, and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord and the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth. So Micah, he says that Bethlehem will be the source of a great ruler. But he also says that the nation of Israel will be abandoned, facing hardships and trials until that son is born. Now the son is a reference to the Messiah. God's chosen one. And so even though they had been abandoned, even though they experienced all these hardships as a nation, even though they were sent into exile, even though now they were living under Roman occupation, they still had hope. They held out hope that this Messiah, the chosen one, would eventually be born and make everything right. Because as the passage continues, that son the son who would come would shepherd the flock of God's people. He would shepherd them with strength and majesty, providing security that would stretch to the end of the earth. So those people who had faced war, who had faced exile, who were kicked from their homes, who were brought back and found themselves as pawns of stronger empires, they were still hoping, just hoping that that chosen one would come and they would rest in God's strength and God's majesty. And, and so we wonder, like, what, what would it feel like to just kind of rest in God's strength and God's majesty? And I think about that moment when you finish moving, you get all the stuff put away and just, like, sit down for the first time. Alicia and I moved a couple months ago, and it felt like for two weeks we just had boxes everywhere. We couldn't eat at our table. Clara loved it. It was like an obstacle course for her just running all over the place. But that moment when all the boxes are put away, everything's in this place, and you just sit down and just have that, ah, you have that restful, peaceful moment. That is what Israel was hoping for, waiting for security, safety, comfort, just to sit and enjoy life as they rested in God's strength, as they rested in God's majesty. But after waiting hundreds of years to feel that hope and experience that peace, I wonder if they ever thought it was coming. And so as we prepare our hearts for Christmas, as we prepare to celebrate the birth of Christ, we're looking back at the hope. We're looking back at the waiting of Israel because we, you and I, we're in the same place of hoping and waiting. God gave us hope in the birth of Jesus Christ. And it doesn't take much for us to acknowledge today that, you know what, we need hope. The world in which we live needs hope. The sad reality I thought about as I was preparing this message this week, I thought that there could be some tragedy that happens in the world that we will have to address in this exact moment. From Wednesday when I was working on this till this morning, there could have been just something horrible that happened. Shootings in churches in our country and in Egypt, disunity and anger over seemingly any issue, not to mention all the, all the personal struggles we face on our own and our families and our lives with, with finances or health or broken relationships or loss of a job or anxiety, or maybe you have finals coming up and you're freaking out about those. So as we look at this equation of given to give, with all the hopelessness we see in our world, and sometimes the hopelessness we see in our lives, sometimes we need to acknowledge, you know what? I need to receive. I need to open up the to us box. You need to open up the to me box and just receive the hope that Jesus has for you. Because we can't always be people who just give and give and give and give. Because if we do that, we're going to be empty eventually. Also, we can't be people who just receive, 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 receive. Because if we do that, we'll end up really bloated. But sometimes we need to know, we need to have the wisdom to say, like, you know what, this is a season where I need to receive. This is a season where I need hope. We need wisdom to know when to receive and when to give. And so maybe you're really a giving person. Like, you don't, you don't make a list for yourself at all because you're like, I don't get anything. I'm just going to buy everybody everything. Just perfect wrapping for everybody that you know. That's just who you are. You want to be a person who gives and gives and gives. And you see some, you have a friend who is having a bad day, and you just want to go and give them a big hug. Like, they don't want a hug, and you're going to give it to them anyway because they look like they need it. Come here. Give them a big hug. 
Maybe someone's going through a difficult season in their life, and you are just a shoulder to cry on. And, not, and just like the ugly cry to you, and you're like, I'm there for you. Maybe, you, maybe a friend just texts you, he's like, man, I'm just having a rough day, and you just show up at their house with dinner for them. You say, here you go. That might be the kind of person you are. You might be a giving person. But we can't always be giving. Sometimes we need to acknowledge the reality that we need to receive the gift. And so maybe, just maybe this Advent season, you need to receive the hope that we have in Christ. The hope that Micah addressed thousands of years ago. Because sometimes we don't want to admit that we just need to hit pause. That we need to sit in the presence of Jesus and receive hope. Because we live in a culture that tells us just to go and go and go and do and do and do. And oftentimes in church, we hear all about how we're supposed to go out and give stuff and be the church and share God's love and do everything we're supposed to do. Like, we're, we get that message all around us. And those are great things. Our faith should be active. We need to be people who seek to serve others and contribute to society. But not at the cost of caring for ourselves. Not at the cost of receiving that which has been given to us in Jesus Christ. And, and so maybe right now, you're like the Israelites, and you're just waiting for that promise of hope to be realized in your life. You're just waiting. Last year at Christmas, Alicia and I, we didn't feel very merry. We were just sort of waiting for hope, because Alicia had started a new job teaching full-time, and that was causing just a lot of stress, and we had a daughter who she'd been sleeping through the night for about two months, and then she reverted during Christmas, and started waking up three or four times a night, and that was just hard. And so we were married, and, and that's the reality. Sometimes we feel that way, that I don't have hope, that I can't keep going. And we all have those seasons where we just need to stand in front of that to us present and receive the hope that God wants to give. And the hope that we have at Christmas is the reality that Jesus is our shepherd. Micah said that the Messiah would come and he would be a shepherd to his people. And so shepherds, they care for their flock, they guide their flock, and they tend to their wounded flock. And so the shepherd of Jesus, he does the same for us. And so do you need someone to care for you right now? Is there stress or anxiety in your life? Do you feel overwhelmed? You've been given hope that Jesus will be your shepherd and care for you. Do you need some guidance right now? Do you have to make a big decision? Are you, are you waiting to see what comes next in your life with school or work or family? You have been given hope that Jesus will be your shepherd and he will guide you. Or maybe this year has just left you a little wounded and you're feeling hurt physically or emotionally. And the hope you need is that in Jesus we've been given a shepherd that will heal our wounds and tend our broken hearts. He will comfort us. And if you're in the place of needing some healing and after dealing with some loss this year, maybe some loss in your past, then I want to invite you on Thursday, December 21st, we're going to have a service called the Longest Night Service. And it's a time just a quiet reflection, some songs and some prayer, just for dealing with grief and loss. So maybe you lost a loved one this year, maybe been facing disease, whatever it is, that this would be a great time just to find hope even when we feel like we're in the darkness. Because the hope that we have is that God gave us a shepherd who would care for us and we could rest securely in his presence. Like the Israelites wanting to rest securely in their home, we just need to be at peace and sit there with Jesus and he will be our hope. That we can have security, that we can have a shepherd who cares for us, who, who tends our wounds, who leads us and guides us and directs us. That is the hope. That's the hope that has been given to us at Christmas. And that's the hope that we can live with every day, regardless of what we're facing. And even if things don't go always the way that we would like them to, we can trust that we still have hope. The hope given to us at Christmas. And so that hope that we've been given, that's also the hope we're called to give. Because at some point, we all need to receive the gift of hope. We all need hope. We all need hope at some point in our lives. And if we need hope, if you and I need hope in our lives, then so does everybody else around us. And we are called to give that hope. Hope is given to us, and we, in turn, should give it to others. 
If we're in need of care, if we're in need of guidance, if we're in need of having our broken hearts tended to, then so is everybody else we know. And we can be that hope. If we have found Jesus, then he is our shepherd who cares for us, and we should bring that hope to the world around us. But this is a shift, because when the Israelites... When the Israelites were initially waiting for Jesus to come, when they were initially waiting for the Messiah, they thought that this hope was going to just be for the nation of Israel. They thought, you know what, this is our hope. We're not going to share it. It's specifically for us. It's a prophecy for us. It's not for anybody else who isn't of the nation of Israel. However, when Jesus was born, some of the very first visitors to Jesus weren't Israelites. They weren't Hebrews. They were magi from a distant land. Matthew 2, 1 through 2 says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. The magi, they were not Hebrews. They were not from the nation of Israel. Yet, the hope that Jesus brought was for them. So the hope of Jesus isn't just for the nation of Israel, isn't just for people in the church. The hope of Jesus is for everyone. And we are called to bring that hope to the world around us. So if we've been given that hope, we should share that hope. Hope has been given to us so that we could give it to others. Now as you look at your life, is there someone you know who could use the hope of a shepherd? Shepherds care for their sheep and those in need. What would it look like for you to give hope to someone in your life who actually needs it? Just somebody who needs some care. Like I said, is there a friend who you can call that you know is having a rough day? Just say, hey, I'm thinking about you. Is the end of the year a tough time for your spouse at work? And you just step up and say, you know what, I'm just going to give you hope by doing a little more. Alicia, she's a high school biology teacher. She has finals coming up. So she's got to teach her finals. She's got to make her finals. She's got to grade her finals. She's got like a mountain of work to do. And I can give her hope by having her come home and be like, so where's my dinner? Right? That's hope. No. I can give her hope by saying, hey, here's dinner. Also, I cleaned the baby and vacuumed. And so you just can work or just watch Netflix or you want to just, just do that. And then I'll do the dishes. Just give, Yeah. Got a lot of support in this service, Alicia. <laughs> so can you do that for your spouse or a roommate or a child? Is there someone that you don't know that doesn't have anywhere to go on Christmas? You can just invite them over to your house. Just say, hey, come on over. And then get them a present. Or like, here's a gift card. Give hope. We all need hope. And we can be the ones who give that hope to others. Another example I had of this this week is one of my good friends, he and his wife just had their first baby. And so I went and visited them, and I brought them a giant box of really good donuts. Because donuts offer hope (laughs) when you have a child who won't sleep. And so I walked in, and I could see just, just, you know, parents know, just like the, the, the desperate look of I've not slept in so long, and I can't remember what's happening, but I still have to be responsible for this tiny human. And it's like, here's some donuts, here's hope. And so just some practical way to give just a little bit of hope. It doesn't have to be a giant thing. We don't have to break through heaven and be like, I'm going to save you. Jesus did that. We just have to give a little bit of hope, a smile, some donuts, a cup of coffee. If I want to look back real quick at the passage. So in Micah chapter 5, verse 4, uh, he writes this, says, He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord. So he will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord and in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. So we also have hope because the Messiah will give us hope in God's strength. And a lot of times we lose hope because we don't feel like we have any control over what's happening in our lives, that we're not strong enough to control what is happening to us. And again, do you know someone who feels like they've lost control? Whether that's because they lost a job, facing addiction, maybe they have family members who are making poor choices, And all those situations, they make us feel powerless. They make the people in your life that you know feel powerless. And sometimes they need hope that they can trust in the strength of the Lord. That even when we feel hopeless, even when we feel we're not in control, we have the strength of the Lord in which we can place our hope. And so maybe you have someone in your life who's going through that situation, and you can just be a source of hope 
by saying, hey, I've been in that same place. I felt as powerless and helpless as you have, but I placed my hope in the strength of the Lord and my life was changed. You can offer hope in that way. Mike also writes that the Messiah will give us hope because of the majesty of the Lord. Now we can hope in the greatness of God because he is better than anything we experience in life. Majesty is kind of that feeling of awe and wonder, like this is so majestic and great that there's nothing better than this. Yet we live in a world and you have people around you who they are, they are in awe of things that don't deserve it. We are looking for majesty in things that cannot provide it. We're looking for majesty in relationships or work or money or possessions. And so you might bring hope to somebody this year by saying, hey, instead of looking at that thing that glitters and fades, look at this thing that will last forever. This majesty that can transform your life. Because the ultimate hope we have in Jesus is that our lives don't have to be about us and chasing all these things that fade away, but our lives can be about firmly planting ourselves on something that never changes, never fades, and will be here forever, throughout eternity. We can hope for something more. And we can be people who help others hope in something more. And you can be that person. I can be that person who tells someone about hope. To just say, hey, this is the difference that God made in my life, to live hope like that. And maybe you're here this morning, you're still just standing in front of that to us box. And you're like, is this really for me? Did Jesus really come for me? Can I have that kind of hope in my life? And you're just standing there staring at that box. And so I would encourage you just to open it, just to take a peek inside to see what it is that Jesus might want to bring in your life. That all throughout this month, as we talk about hope and love and joy and faith and peace, just examine what it would look like to receive that gift in your life. To hope beyond hope that there's someone who loves you more than you could ever know. To hope beyond hope that there's someone who wants to be a part of your life desperately and bring you hope. So I just encourage you this, this month, just, just take a peek in that box. That box that has what Jesus gave, gave us, that present that Jesus gave us. It is the best present ever. And you don't have to wait till Christmas morning to open it up. And so hopefully, as we've seen this morning, that, that we have hope. In Christ, we have hope. We have hope that we come back to God. We have hope that we can find comfort in this life. We have hope that we be transformed. We have hope that we can partner with the Holy Spirit to see this world transformed more and more into God's kingdom. That is a lot of hope. And it all started with a little baby boy born in Bethlehem. But that hope isn't just for us, it has been given to us so that we might give it to others. And now you might be in a place, as we discussed, you might just be in a place of needing to receive hope. That you're like, I've got nothing to give. Awesome. Stand in front of the to us box and just receive hope. Receive it. That might be where you're at. But we also need to acknowledge that at some point we have to stop receiving and start giving hope. Because there's a world out there in desperate need of hope. And if we found Jesus, if we claim him as Lord and Savior, then we have the answer that the world is seeking. We need to talk about that hope. We need to share that hope. But more importantly, we need to live out that hope. 1 Peter 3.15 says, But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Now, this is a great verse that people like to quote, just kind of like, yeah, we have to have an answer. I have to be ready. If someone asks me about my faith, I have to have an apologetics answer. I have to be ready to stand firm on my faith and answer the question. And that's great. We need to do that. We need to stand up for our faith. But the verse says that people are only going to ask us about our faith if they see hope in our lives. Everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope, so people will see us, they will see the hope with which we're living, and they'll say, dang, that's different. I want to be like that. And so they'll see us living with hope, and then they will come and say, hey, why are you like this? they will be like, Jesus, that's the answer we're prepared to give, but only when people see us living with hope. Our world is so desperate for hope that if we actually live with it, people will notice, and they will be intrigued, and they will want to know more. 
So what would it look like, just real quick, what would it look like for you to live with hope this week, to live with hope that someone might see you and ask you why you live differently? You could try smiling at people as they walk by. Just not creepy like that, but, you know, use your smile. I go running sometimes. I don't like it, but I do it. And so I'll be out there running. I used to, like, I'd see other people, and I would not, like, I'd be like, oh, no, here's a person. I'm, like, it's a long stretch of road. So you see him kind of like, just, like, look, like, oh, look, my shoes are really interesting. Fall and break. But I would just avoid eye contact. I'm like, you know what? Like, Jesus wants me to be nicer and live with hope. So I'm going to look at people in the eye when I run by them. So I'm like, okay, oh, somebody's coming. Somebody's coming. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> and just keep going. Just smile at somebody. Give them some hope that way. Talk to your neighbor. Don't like just, you know, you do it. You open your garage, zoom in as fast as you, like you start hitting the button for your garage as soon as you leave the office because you want it to open as soon as it can. You race in there like speed racing. You slam the door shut. Like, whoo. Don't have to talk to anybody now. Talk to your neighbors. We have this sweet older lady who lives across from us. She is really nice, like nice, nice. She likes us. She likes our dog. She likes our daughter. She has a dog. She is so nice. There is nothing bad that comes from interacting with this woman. But sometimes I'm like, oh, man, I just heard her go outside. I don't want to go outside. Yes, I want to talk to her. (laughs) Me, I need to just talk to her because she's really nice. I can give hope in that way. She's probably sitting in church like, I really need to give hope to that weird guy. He doesn't talk to anybody. <laughs> don't complain with everybody at work. Like if you're sitting in the lunchroom and it's like, ah, blah, 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 like, don't do it. Give hope that way. Live differently. If you're a parent, give hope to your kids this Christmas season. Don't be a Grinch. <laughs> I don't want to put up decorations. I don't want to Christmas is the word. Give hope to your kids. Like, hey, you know why we're celebrating? Because Jesus was born. Let your kids see your hope in your life. Don't post anything angry or inflammatory on Facebook. Just don't do it. Don't. Just stop. Post pictures of your kids and picture your dogs. That's all anybody wants to see. Just do that. Don't cut someone off who's trying to get a parking spot for you at Target. (laughs) Santa Slay ain't got nothing on me. I just got that parking spot. Don't huff and roll your eyes in line at the store when it's taking too long. Yeah, the checker don't want you there either. <laughs> Live with some hope. We've been given hope in so many ways. And look, those are all ridiculous, but we all do them. And so if we really want to live hope, we, sometimes we want to like put living hope is this high falloon. It's like, oh, I'm going to live with hope, and I'm going to have a white robe, and I'm going to have an angel, and I'm going to float, and I'm like, I'll live with hope. That doesn't happen. Living with hope happens when we interact with other people who make us mad. Living with hope happens in those situations where we want to get angry. Living with hope happens in those situations where we just don't want to listen anymore. Living with hope means I'm going to live with hope. Jesus has given me so much. Everything is going to be okay. That is what hope tells us, that I can smile to that person. I can stop complaining at the office. I can not huff in line. I cannot get angry with my kids when they want to play with the same toy that makes the same noise 12 different times. We can live with hope. We can share that hope. It has been given to us so that we might give it to others. Jesus Christ came to earth so that we could have hope. We should be people who live with that hope and give that hope. I'd like to invite the worship team up as we prepare for communion. Because the greatest hope we have of all, the, the reason why Jesus came to be with us in the first place, is the hope that we have in the cross. Because in the cross, we have hope that our sins can be washed away, that we can enter back to right relationship with God. God saw us separated from him because of our sin, which is why he sent Jesus in the first place to be our hope. Jesus gave us hope through this life, showing us the best way to live. He gave us hope through his death, giving us hope that our sins could be atoned for. He gave us hope through his resurrection, that we could actually experience new life and be transformed. That is the hope that we remember and celebrate as we come to the communion table. So we're going to pass out the elements, and we'll all take them together once everyone has received them. And the table is open to everyone who has accepted the hope of Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And if you've never done that before, and maybe you you just want to open that box and you want to embrace that hope, then it's a simple prayer of saying, you know what, confessing with your mouth, 
that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. And you can take communion. A simple prayer like that can transform your life and give you the hope that transformed the universe. The hope that remember as we come to the Lord's table. Receive the elements. I encourage you to, to listen to this special song that we're going to play for you. Reflect on the word. And if you want to sing along, we invite you to do that.
It's always a beautiful moment when we can come together at the Lord's table. And I find that the beauty exists in the simple act of taking these two elements and that together, as one voice, what we do is we proclaim Christ's death, we proclaim Christ's return, and we proclaim the gift of hope that he has given. And so Jesus, just hours before he was tried and crucified, was sharing a meal with his disciples, his friends. And then he turns to them and he simply says, this bread represents my body, given for you. Take in remembrance of me. He then took the cup, gave thanks to God, and then says, this is my blood that confirms the covenant between God and his people, poured out, poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Drink and remember to me. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice. Your unending love for us. May this moment be a reminder of the hope you offer us. The same hope that you have gifted us that we can gift to others.
we'd like to continue worshiping with the giving of our tithes and offerings. So I'd like to invite the ushers forward. Once the baskets pass from you, I invite you to stand up with us. We'll sing one more song together this morning. Why don't we thank our worship team and our tech team. Thank you. Thank you so much for choosing to be here with us this morning. We're very happy that you were here. And just kind of uh, another thing that we're doing sort of through the season of Give In to Give. Uh, we as a church, uh, obviously got YED and we're doing all that. We ask that, you know, hope that you would consider that and how to give towards that. But as a church, we've also decided that we want to be a church that is kind of living this out and giving as we're, as we're given. So 
Uh, every week, we're going to be kind of highlighting something that we're doing, just that we decided we should do. So this week, we want to give hope. And so we're going to be giving hope to three families in Pakistan by buying them all a goat. Uh, so because a goat is like a goat isn't just like, hey, it's a pet goat. Like it's hope because it produces milk and can actually jumpstart a, fi- a family's just financial future and just even giving them sustenance for like goat's milk and goat cheese, which is delicious. So, so we're going to give some goats. So goat equals hope. <sighs> Yep, I'll see you guys never uh, again. Uh, so, uh, so yes, let's read it. So, uh, so yeah, why don't you just extend your hands? We'll just receive this uh, simple benediction. It's just the Lord may He bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face to shine upon you. May the Lord lift the light of His countenance upon you, and give you peace. In the, name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Have a great week.